Hello, uh, we just had two lectures now discussing uh, the introduction for abstract algebra and of course we had also uh, some preliminary topics for this course. So, so far we are done with the sets. We also discussed relations, functions. Uh, we even discussed uh, modular arithmetic in the previous lectures. So now we are going to uh, continue our lecture. We will start with a definition, a definition of partitions and cells. So what does a partition mean, especially in this course? A partition of a set S is uh, simply a decomposition of S into non-empty disjoint subsets such that every element of S is in exactly one of the subsets. So this is actually what we mean by disjoints. The subsets are called the cells of the, the partition. Uh, this, is, this definition is actually uh, uh, explanatory, self-explanatory. So we have to make sure that uh, the partitioning creates a subsets, subsets of uh, this set such that these subsets uh, uh, the intersections uh, is actually the null set. That's uh, another way of saying that the subsets are disjoint. Uh, let's have an example. Splitting, the word splitting means partitioning. So we have this set. This is the set of the positive integers. We want to split it or partition it into uh, subsets of even positive integers and uh, the subset of odd positive integers. So we obtain a partition with two cells. So this is actually the corresponding partition of, of this, of the set of positive integers into two. So one cell, uh, the, the elements, are actually the even numbers and for the other cell it composed it's comprised of the odd numbers or yes elements of z plus positive integers of course we can partition the same set into three according to the remainder when divided by three when you divide any positive integer by three there will be three uh, cases there either it provides us a remainder of zero one or two so we can use that as a tool or it's as an algorithm to partition all the elements of the positive integers so the first cell here is actually a set composing all the positive integers that when divided by three yields a remainder of zero so we have zero uh wait i don't think zero is even included in in our set because we are actually uh talking only about the positive integers let me change this one for a bit so actually we should start with two and a one and two there so this is the partitioning of uh, the set of positive integers by considering the remainder so the first cell again uh, is the set containing the numbers whose remainder is zero the second cell is the set containing the numbers uh, whose remainder is one when divided by three and then again, um, the third cell is the set composing numbers or comprised of numbers, positive integers that provides or yields a remainder of two when divided by three. Uh, we can actually generalize our two examples here for uh, the set of positive integers. So the set of positive integers can be partitioned into n cells 
according to whether the remainder is 0, 1, 2, until n minus 1. The cells that are created in this particular example are called residue classes modulo n in the set of positive integers. So uh, basically, we are uh, providing, of course, you can partition a particular or a given set in, in different ways. Uh, our example simply focused on the positive integers and uh, considering and using the, the remainders. Okay, uh, let's proceed now to what we mean by an equivalence re relation. Uh, well, of course, it has to be a relation and we again recall what we mean by a relation. So we start from the cross product of two sets. If only one set is involved, we say that's, that is a relation on, uh, say the given set is S, then that's a relation on S. So we are taking simply a subset of the cross product of the sets that's involved. Of course, in each ordered pair of that, the element of the relation, the first uh, number must come from the first set and the second number must come from the second set. Unre unless it's a relation on S, then for each ordered pair, uh, you simply check if the elements or the numbers there per ordered pair comes from set S. Anyway, uh, when is a relation considered an equivalence relation? By definition, an equivalence relation R on a non-empty has to be non-empty set S is one that satisfies these three properties for all X, Y, Z. These are arbitrary elements of the given set. So what are these three properties that needs to be satisfied for you to consider a relation an, an, an equivalence relation. An equivalence, equivalence relation is simply a specific type of a relation. First, we need to show this property. We prove that R is reflexive. And what do we mean by reflexive? That if X is an element of S, then X must be related to X x must be related to itself the second property is symmetry we need to show symmetry so this involves now two arbitrary elements from s so our hypothesis is if x is related to y then y must be related to x if we are able to show this one therefore r here this relation here is symmetric and of course, the third one, transitivity, we show that R is, transi uh, is, is transitive. Sorry. Uh, to show that, we need to involve three arbitrary elements from uh, set S. So our hypothesis is this one. If X is related to Y and Y is related to Z, this is our conclusion. If we are able to show it, then, then we say that it is transitive. What is that? that x is related to z. Our first example, we are already saying that the equality relation, that is a set comprised of ordered pairs whose or, or coordinates are the same. So that's the, the set, the set of x, y, the set of all ordered pairs x, y, such that x is equal to y this one or yes this is uh, the subset representing the equality relation and that is an equivalence relation although uh, I, I don't think I've included the proof here but let's have another example an example of a relation and then show that it is an equivalence relation by showing that everything every property here every requirement here is satisfied all right so i've i have included here our guide 
the properties that we need to check for it to be considered an equivalence relation. So this is what we're going to approve. We're going to define first a relation R. Of course, it's a relation, so the, the elements must be ordered pairs, but it's coming from the cross product, this cross product. So this therefore, this is a relation on the set of integers. And this is the definition of the relation. So two numbers, x and y, are related if, upon subtracting the two numbers, it is divisible by 3. So we want to show that this subset, this set of ordered pairs, is an equivalence relation. So we start by proving that R is reflexive. To show reflexivity, the first thing to do here is to identify one element, arbitrary element, from the given set. And the set that we are actually working on here is the set of positive integers. So how do we show that it is re reflexive? We show that for any given A from this set, set of integers, it satisfies this relation. So we need to show that the ordered pair a and a is an element of the relation but how do we do that we use the definition of the relation it is included in this relation if it satisfies this condition satisfies this condi condition that is when we subtract the two elements here it is divisible by three well if if we subtract a and a that will give us a zero and of course obviously zero is divisible by three so yes regard regardless of not knowing the exact value of a we are sure that the ordered pair a and a is in the relation because it is always divisible by zero because zero is always divisible by i mean divisible by three not divisible by zero so yes, this this uh, element is always, or this ordered pair is always an element of R. So we are able to show that R is a reflexive. The second one is to show that R is symmetric. And to show symmetry, we need to identify two arbitrary elements of the same set. So we simply name two. Uh, in this case, let us use A and B. So what do we need to show here remember that our hypothesis for symmetry if a b is an element of z then b a must also be an element of of uh, r uh, the relation that we are talking about this one so this is the hypothesis this is the conclusion that we need to show now uh, to, to prove, we start with the hypothesis and then by direct proof, we're, we're going to arrive at the conclusion. So A minus B is divisible by 3. That's given. So if it's divisible by 3, then we, we can express this difference A minus B as 3K. That is 3 times A, any, any integer. That is, for some key element of uh, integers, the set of integers. Well, A minus B is just the same as, or actually what we did here is to multiply both sides of the equation by negative 1. Uh, that is multiplicative property of equality. The equality is maintained if you're going to multiply the same amount to both sides. So, by taking the negative of each side, we have... That's negative A plus B or B minus A. Because addition or subtraction, uh, I mean, addition is actually uh, transitive. Negative 3K is, of course, the same as 3 times negative K for some K element of the set of integers. And if, if B minus A is or can be written as 3 times something, then it is evident that 
b minus a is divisible by 3 because b minus a is just the same as 3 times something. So we are able to show that b a, this ordered pair, is an element of the relation because b minus a is divisible by 3. Okay. Last to show is transi transi uh, transitivity or, or that r is transitive. Tra tra why do I keep saying on transitive? Transitive. I am supposed to say transitive. For this, we want to identify muna three arbitrary elements from this set. Such that, I think that is an error. That is supposed to be, where am I? B, C. Yes. There. So we need three elements coming from the set of integers of fours such that this is the hypothesis. The hypothesis for transitivity is that if these two ordered pairs A, B, and B, C are elements of R, it is transitive or R is transitive if we are able to show that what it what is what it what should we uh, show here the order pair ac is an element of r so again similar with what we did in the second step by direct proof we show what we need to show that is by starting from the hypothesis so if if a b and bc are elements of r then a minus b and b minus c are divisible by three because that's the only way that an ordered pair is a member of this uh, defined relation. And if that's the case, then we can express both of A minus B and B minus C as something that is divisible by 3. So let's use uh, the variables or the letters N and M. A minus B is equal to 3N for some N element of Z. And B minus C is equal to 3M for some M element of uh, the set of integers well from here from this step uh, because we are trying to solve or to look for an expression equivalent to what we, what do we really need to show here a minus c we want to know whether a minus c is divisible by 3 or not so what we're going to do here is to solve for b so from this second step we're going to solve for b for both of the equations we have two equations here for the first equation this can be written as b equal to a minus 3n by simple algebra the same way with the other equation so b equals c plus 3m and then we equate the two equations so if b is equal to a minus 3n and also the same uh, quantity b is equal to a 3 plus or c plus 3m then we can actually write a minus 3n is equal to c plus 3m for some k that is not why do we have this this should be deleted i'm sorry for some n and m element of the set of integers kindly delete this one we do not include this one this comes from i think from the previous slide Anyway, uh, working with this, working with this equation, then we can actually provide another expression equivalent to a minus c, and that is 3n plus 3m. And 3n plus 3m can be rewritten as 3 times or 3 times n plus m. And again, obviously, this expression is divisible by 3 because we have a factor of 3. We now conclude that the ordered pair AC is always an element of R for arbitrary elements A, B, and C. We now conclude that R is an equivalence relation. Why is that? It's because we are able to show that the three properties are satisfied. Well, if one of them is not satisfied, then we cannot say that that is an equivalence relation. It's just an ordinary relation. That also means that when we are able to show that it is not reflexive, we can 
always identify or know now that it is not an equivalence relation. Therefore, we do not need to show that the two elements are uh, satisfied if our goal is just to identify whether that relation is equivalence relation or not. Okay, I have another example here. The relation is the set of all ordered pairs x, y such that x is less than y. We show that this is an equivalence relation or not. Meaning if one or two or more than two of the uh, or at least one of the properties uh, is not satisfied. So we start with showing that it is reflexive. So again, for uh, reflexivity, we need to identify one arbitrary element from the set uh, considered. At uh, this time, the set considered here is the set of real numbers. So this is a relation on R. So A is an arbitrary element of uh, the set of real numbers. We need to show that AA, this ordered pair, is, an, is in the relation, is an element of uh, this relation. That is, if we are able to show that A is less than A, but, well, of course, obviously it's not. A cannot be less than itself. So, this ordered pair cannot be included in this relation. So, we are not able to show that uh, R is reflexive. So, we can immediately conclude that it is not an equivalence relation. Well, well of course, you can... Uh, do or show whether the two other properties are are uh, satisfied so that you'd know which spe specifically which of the properties are identif are are satisfied i mean but if your all your goal is to identify whether it's an equivalence relation or not then this is enough to show that it is not okay we have another term here, equivalence class. What do we mean by an equivalence class? It actually stems from an equivalence relation. So let's read the definition first. Let R be an equivalence relation. So we are already talking about a relation that's already, that is already considered an equivalence relation. So meaning it satisfies the three properties. For all x element of the set A, let this notation denote the set of all y element of A such that y is related to x. Then this set is called the equivalence class with respect to R determined by x. In other words, this is just uh, the subsets. The equivalence class are just the subsets created using or considering a particular equivalence relation. Let me show you again uh, the same example we used a while back. The relation containing the ordered pairs x, y such that x minus y is divisible by 3. So we are able to show that this is an equivalence relation. So the, the, the premise is uh, uh, satisfied. Now, what are the, the corresponding equivalence classes for this particular equivalence relation? Well, we can actually um, identify the equivalence classes by first identifying one element of what is x of a. So our set here. The, the set being considered here is the set of integers. So just identify one. So suppose we are going to identify zero. So what is the equivalence class corresponding to this element? So it's a set. These are the numbers, integers, that would yield the same remainder as with zero. For example, negative three, zero, three, 6, 9, these are actually uh, numbers that are divisible by 0. I mean, are 3. D divisible by 3 meaning the remainder is 0. 
what are other equivalence classes? Well, if we are dividing a number by 3, again, there are three possibilities. Either you come up with a remainder of 0, 1, or 2. So the second equivalence class is actually corresponding to the set. So we used number 1 here, meaning uh, the set containing all integers that are divisible by or are not divisible by 3. Specifically, uh, it provides a remainder of 1 when divided by 3. This is the third equivalence class for this particular equivalence relation. So you see that these sets, when we're going to take the union, it's actually the same as a, we can actually think of it as a natural partitioning of set A. So an equivalence relation could provide a way to partition a particular set. And I think there is a slide for that in this presentation. Properties of equivalence class. So let R be an equivalent relation, equivalence relation rather, on a set A. Then the following are actually satisfied. The following properties are satisfied. Number one, for all X element of A, the equivalence class determined by X on R is of course cannot be equal to the null hypothesis uh, the null the null si uh, set sorry why is that because that the for for an equivalence relation for a relation to be an equivalence relation it has to be uh, working with non-empty set so it cannot be actually the null set second if y is an element of this equivalence class then the equivalence class determined by x is the same equivalence class determined by y. What does this mean or how do we illustrate this property? So let's consider the first equivalence class in our example above. Can I write the equivalence class determined by 3 and the set is just the same? The answer is yes because 3 is an element of the equivalence class determined by x. I can actually use 6. So the equivalence class 6. So I'm going to write the same. I will just change this one uh, to 6. But the elements of the set is just the same. Also, for this equivalence class, the, the middle equivalence class, I can just use 10. So the equivalence class determined by 10 with respect to this particular particular equivalence class is the same set. That is this what this property uh, mean. Third, for all x, y element of A, either the equivalence class determined by x is the same as the equivalence determined by y or the two equivalence class are completely different. That is this expression, equality mean. That is, the intersection is the null set. This is only saying that two equivalence class are either exactly the same or exactly different. And of course, D, I think I mentioned this one. If you take the union of all the elements of the elements of the equivalent classes, because equivalent classes are subsets, just subsets, it will of course yield the same set that was used in defining uh, the equivalence relation. In this particular example, again, it's the set of integers. Another concept, con congruence modulo. Congruence modulo is actually an example of an equivalence relation. But what kind of equivalence relation are we talking about or what is involved? It's, of course, involving uh, modulo n. So, congruence modulo is an equivalence relation on the set of positive integers corresponding to the partition of the positive integers into residue classes modulo n. And again, residue classes modulo n, that those are the cells, the cells or the subsets uh, created when you use this one as a way to partition a particular set. It is denoted by A congruent to B mod N read as uh, the, what is written here. 
so this is uh, we actually had a review of what we mean by modulo modulo in, in we say that two numbers are congruent that's why we read this one as a congruent to b mod n if the two numbers have the same rem remainder when divided by n or uh, how else can we say it if a minus b is divisible by n or if n divides a minus b that is the definition or what we mean by a congruent to b mod n so actually our example this example here can be written as x is congruent to y mod 3 and this is a specific this is a specific example of a modulo n, congruence modulo, modulo n. And if it's a congruence modulo n, congruence modulo 3 to be specific, that is considered an equivalence relation. Equivalence relation and partition, I think I mentioned this one. Uh, ano yung sinasabi nito? Let S be a non-empty set and let this one be an equivalence relation on S, then that yields a natural partition of S, where this is the equivalence class, right? So it's it's basically saying that the equivalence relation, if we are able to show that it's an equivalence relation, then that equivalence relation yields a natural partitioning. So modulo n is an example. Congruence modulo n is an equivalence class. That's why it yields a natural partition of the given set. Uh, this is in, vi in, in vice versa. If we have a partition of S, what do we mean by partition? The subsets must be disjoints. It gives rise to a natural equival equivalence relation on S. This is an example. It's the same example. So basically, because we are able to show that R is an equivalence relation, we know that this gives a natural partitioning. And that natural natural partitioning is this one. Now, suppose we change this one to 4. X minus Y is divisible by 4. How many partitions could we create? Well, there are four cases or scenarios. Either a number is, when divided by 4, it yields a remainder of 0, a remainder of 1, a remainder of 2, or a remainder of 3. So there would be four uh, different partitions for this particular equivalence relation. All right. So this chapter, preliminary topics, we're going to end it with another way of proving so remember that the first preliminary topic that we had are the different uh, methods of proof. Uh, we, but we did not actually discuss how we uh, discussed one. Uh, it's called mathematical induction. This is another method of proof. And uh, that is what we're going to illustrate. So what is mathematical induction? This is used to prove that a statement about positive integers is true for all positive integers, or perhaps for some finite or infinite sequence of consecutive integers. The validity of the method rests on uh, this axiom of positive integers. So it's the, the this mathematical induction is normally applicable if what we're proving is something about integers or series of integers. For real numbers, uh, medyo, I'm not sure if we can actually apply mathematical induction. Uh, you would understand that using the following induction axiom. So the induction axioms helps us to uh, do mathematical induction. We start with S being a subset of the set of positive integers, satisfying Number one, that one is an element of S, and if K is an element of S, then K plus one is also an element of S. Then the two sets, S and the set of positive integers, are the same. Well, 
if you really if you read this one it's quite funny because of course it's obvious if one is an element and if k is an element and every k plus one is an element of s then it has to be the same as the set of positive integers now uh, we proceed to the actual steps of doing or conducting mathematical induction so there are actually two steps we call uh, the first step the base case and then the second one the induction step let p of n be a statement concerning the positive integers n suppose that p of n is true and we will assume that p of k is true and we are able to show that p of k plus 1 is true then p of n is true for all n element of the set of positive integers so basically um the base case is to show that this one what are we are doing in the first step we are going to show that the statement is true for n equal to 1 because again well 1 is the smallest element in the set of positive integers and then the induction step we have to assume assume first that the statement is true for n equal to k and then we show that the statement is true for n equal to the next element after k that's k plus one all right let's have an example so we have this is a series if we're going to add all the positive integers starting from one until some value there so we're going to denote that by n it's actually given by the formula n times n plus one divided by two so we're going to show that this is this statement is true for all for all n element of the set of positive integers so we start with the base case that is we show that this is true for n equal to one it's actually uh, easy for us to show that it is true. This is true for n equal to 1 by substitution. So if n is equal to 1, then the left side of this equation is just 1. And then the right side, the right side, if we substitute 1 here, we will arrive at 1. So we see that the left-hand side and the right-hand side are both 1. And thus, the statement, this statement is true for n equal to 1. The induction step, that's the second step, we're going to assume that the statement is true for k, n equal to k. So the sum of the integers from 1 to k is just the same as k times k plus 1 all over 2. We are going to assume that that is true. What we need to show actually is that p of k plus 1 is true that is we need to show that this statement is true so later on we will arrive at this expression if we are able to arrive at this expression then the statement is true for all n element of the positive integers anyway how do we do that how do we do that we need to start with one side and then come up with the other side. That is normally how we do mathematical induction. What do we mean by that? So we have our left side. That's 1 plus 2 plus k until k plus 1. Well, if we're going to remove k plus 1. So remember, if we stop at k. 1 plus 2 plus until k. Remember that we assume that to be equal to k plus k plus 1 over 2. So that is what we're looking at uh, the right, right side. If we're going to add k plus 1, then logically, we have to add it to the same, uh, add the same amount to the to the other side of the equation just to, to balance the, the equation. And then working on with, with this one, because this is just the same as the left side. Working it with this one by simple algebra, so we are simply combining it. These two fractions here, we have k times k plus 1 plus twice k plus 1 all over 2. And then, uh, in the numerator, we can actually factor out k plus 1 
we notice that it's just the same factor, so it becomes k plus 1 times k plus 2 all over 2. And k plus 2 can be rewritten as, I think this is, there's an error there, let me change it. There. It's k plus 2 is the same as k, the quantity k plus 1 plus 1, which is what we want to show. So we were able to arrive at the conclusion at the right hand side of the equation. So this is an example of mathematical induction. I'm going to end uh, the lecture with this. Uh, thank you for listening.